languages that we use on web page. It's sort of one of the three fundamental languages that we use. <coughs> um, we, of course, have used HTML throughout the semester. And HTML essentially is for the content and the structure of, of, a, of a page. So the stuff that appears on the page, the links, the text, the images, all the content of the page is represented in HTML, as well as the structure. In other words, we group things together to form a header. We group things together to form a navigation. We group things into sections and footers and so on. So I'll call that the logical structure of the page. We've used CSS for the appearance of the page and for the physical layout. And the physical layout really relates to the structure because usually we want the physical layout to reflect the structure. In other words, the header we want to look a certain way, the nav we want to look a certain way, uh, each section we want to look a certain way, and, and so on. When JavaScript comes into the mix by bringing in behavior and interactivity. Keep in mind these are generalizations. We could certainly go into more detail and talk about other aspects of JavaScript, but essentially we're talking about behavior. Uh, most of the JavaScript examples, at least the ones that we're going to go over, are behavior, uh, interactivity. And what that simply means, what I mean by interactivity, is that the user does something and the page somehow responds to that. So the page somehow makes a visible change um, as a result of a user action. And we talked about the advantage of doing it via JavaScript, and that is because as the client loads a page from the server, this trip through the internet to go to the server to get more information actually takes a little bit of time. Whereas if the client is delivered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and that JavaScript can be responsible for making little changes to the page. Those changes can happen virtually instantaneously. So that's a big win for the client, because with JavaScript, the changes that are made to the page happen instantly. It's actually a win for the server as well, because the server then is not hampered and, and bogged down by little requests. And the classic example we had of that, did I turn it on its side? Yeah. It's upside down. There we go. The classic example of that would be something like we saw on the ESPN page where we had menus that you can use. And as you put your mouse over one of the menu items, then we see uh, a full menu appear. Notice that to originally load the page, it takes a little bit of time. Why? Because we're going out to the server and we're getting back a bunch of information from the server. And we're not just getting information that you see, we're getting information that you don't see either. We're getting all those menus that are currently hidden. And, uh, and we're also getting JavaScript, which allows us to show or hide those menus. And when we put our mouse over the different items on, this, on the screen, we're not going back to the server to get that information. The information is already delivered. We're simply 
changing the page, all right, by making things visible that used to be invisible and vice versa. All right, so that's sort of an overview of JavaScript. How do we accomplish JavaScript? JavaScript involves a couple of things. And again, keep in mind these are general statements. Yes, you can find examples of JavaScript that don't work this way, but <coughs> especially the examples we're going to go over and in, in, in many JavaScript usages follow this pattern. Number one, there is a user event that gets the ball rolling. This is sort of the recipe for JavaScript. And what do I mean by a user event? I mean the user interacting with things on the page. Typically, how do users interact with things on the page? Typically, it's going to be with the mouse or with the keyboard. All right? So, in the case of ESPN, the user interaction is the user puts their mouse over one of these menu items. So the user is interacting with that. So the user can put their mouse on things. The user can click on something. The user can hit a key. The user can put their mouse off of something. All these are examples of user interactions. And that's what sort of gets the ball rolling for the JavaScript examples that we're going to talk about is that there is a user uh, interaction, a user event that occurs. Secondly, there's something called the DOM. DOM stands for Document Object Model. The short explanation of the DOM is that the document object model allows us to point to a specific thing on the page and change something about it, do something to it. That's the purpose of the DOM. All right? Through code, we can say, for example, when I put my mouse over NFL, find the NFL menu on the page and make it visible. Now, there's a specific syntax that we're going to use to say, find the NFL menu and make it visible. All right? So the DOM is sort of the language that, that is used inside of JavaScript as a way of addressing things. It's a way of pointing to something specific on the page. All right, because when we put our mouse over something, we don't want to make all the menus appear, right? We want to make a specific menu appear. So we have to be able to point to the thing on the page that we want to change, all right? And more importantly, what do we want to change about it, all right? In this case, well, we want to make it visible, but in other cases, we might want to change the color of it we might want to make other changes to it. So that is the DOM, the language that we use, the doc document object model is sort of a uh, part of JavaScript that allows us to refer to things on the page and their properties. What do I mean by properties? Well, we've been dealing with properties all along, right? Properties are things like the SRC property of an image, right? We talked about that when we talked about images, that images have, this image tag has an SRC property. That is the image that we want to show. That's a property of that image tag. Property is a characteristic or additional information about it. It's an image tag, well, what image do we want to show? We want to show that image. 
Well, through the document object model, we can point to that image property, and we can change it. So we can do an image swap. So many of you have probably seen photo galleries where you have thumbnails and images that you click on the thumbnail, and it brings up a copy of the big image. That's something that can be accomplished via JavaScript. All right. Properties are also the CSS property of things. So we might have, for example, this is a CSS property that the thing that has an ID of menu one, we set its visibility property to false. So that will make it hidden. And we can specify that in our CSS file. Well, through JavaScript, we can change that. We can point to the thing on the screen that we want to change, and we can change that property from visible to in, from invisible to visible, or from visible to invisible. All right. So with the DOM, we can point to things and we can address the properties. And by properties, I mean either properties in CSS or properties in HTML. All right? Lastly, there's the JavaScript language itself. where we can do statements like you would have in any programming language. So some of you might be taking C Sharp, for example, or Java, or other languages, where you have things like loops and if statements and mathematical calculations and things like that. With JavaScript, we can do this functionality as well. We can put if statements in, and we can put loops in, and we can do all sorts of things. So that's sort of the three pieces of JavaScript. The user event, which um, gets the ball rolling. The DOM, which allows us to point to specific things on the page and access <clears throat> their properties, so we can access and manipulate the properties. And then finally, there's the, the JavaScript syntax itself that allows us to write more involved sorts of things that do calculations or do loops or if statements or whatever. Um, JavaScript, sort of, uh, uh, the kind of JavaScript we're working on is uh, another term that's often used for it is client side scripting. Because again, it happens on the client side. It doesn't happen on the server side. Remember, we talked about server side scripting a couple weeks back. But this kind of JavaScript is oftentimes called server side scripting. As just a note, uh, a lot of students say this, and, and a lot of times I will correct them, and I'm not being difficult. Um, is that it is, it is really a misstatement. If people say uh, something about putting, you know, I'm working on the Java assignment in this class. JavaScript is not Java. JavaScript is a web programming language that's similar to Java. Um, there is Java included within web pages, uh, typically on the server side. Those are things like JSP pages and Java servlets and things like that. But when we speak about JavaScript, it's its own thing. It's, you know, it's unfortunate that it was called JavaScript because that does cause some confusion. But know that what we're writing here is not Java code. It's JavaScript code. Now, the syntax is going to look very similar. And that's why they called it JavaScript, probably. Um, so, you know, when you're JavaScript, think it's like Java-like script, all right? It's like Java, but it's not Java. Okay, so we're going to make a simple page to start out, and we're going to do something about as simple as possible, where we're going to um, put, um, a, a, put a self-quiz together, all right? Let's say I wanted to create a quiz, like as a, a study guide. 
And not like a quiz to be graded, but just a, a way to self-test yourself, where it asks you a question, and you can think of the answer, and then you can check your answer. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to make a, an HTML page. And we're going to see how HTML, JavaScript, and CSS all work together to achieve this functionality. So I'm going to put a question here in a paragraph. What does HTML stand for? And before it, or after it, I'm going to put the answer. So I'm going to go and save this. Now, notice there's no CSS whatsoever in here, which means that I'm going to see the question, I'm going to see the answer. So I go here, I see the question, I see the answer, all right? Well, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to make it so that the answer is hidden. And I could do this a couple different ways. I'm going to include the CSS in this page just to make it a little easier so we can see everything at the same time. And I'm going to go in and say, make my style. And I'm going to give this guy a class of answer. Now. We can actually make something invisible two different ways. That doesn't look right. Oh, there we go. We can actually make something invisible two ways. One way we can make it invisible is to set the visibility to false. The other way is we can say the display is none. Uh, we'll look at the difference between the two. Right now, I will make the visibility of anything in the class of answer, I want to make the visibility false. All right. So I go and look at this. Open it up. And no, no, 
No, it's not visibility. Is visibility hidden? You are right, though. It's not false. My mistake. There we go. And it's not there. And so I can do this by more than one question. So I can have what does CSS stand for? And let's put one more question. or false Okay, so I have three questions and three answers. The questions are visible, the answers are not. All right. Now, what we want to do is we want to uh, make the answers visible if the user does something. And we can do that a couple different ways. Uh, one way I can do that is I can put a button on the page. So, I'm going to put in this paragraph, and I'm going to skip the form tag because I'm not really sending anything to the server. I'm not sure if that would give me an error if I validated it or not, but if it did, I'll, I'd put a form tag in. But I'm going to put in an input, and I'm going to say the type equals button. What's the difference between a button and a submit button? A submit button sends the code to the server, sends the form data to the server to be processed. A button, you have to code in JavaScript what you want the button to do. So there's no default behavior on a button, all right? So if I, I can put a button on here, and if I don't put some JavaScript code on it, the button will just sit there, and I can click away all day, and nothing happens. All right. Now, here's where the JavaScript recipe comes in. First of all, I need a user event. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can assign user events. I'm going to go over the simplest way first. We may or may not cover a more complicated way. Um, but the simpler way to do it is you put in an HTML attribute that says on, and then you specify the event. Now, I didn't make up on click. That's one of the hard-coded events. And if we look, and we look at JavaScript events, you can see a whole bunch of them. And most of them are about the user interaction, all right? Here's some common ones. On change, on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, and on load. Those are some of the most common, but there's more of them. All right. If you look, here's a whole list of them. And 
and they all start with the word on. So in other words, when this happens, so when the user clicks on this button, I want something to happen. That's what on click said. Well, what do I want to have happen? I want to show this answer. All right. How do I show the answer? Well, the first thing I have to do is I have to point to this. I have to point to this and only this, right? Because I don't want to show the other answers. I only want to show this answer. All right? So if I want to do something to just one thing on the page, exactly one thing on the page, I need to give it an ID. Right? Because a class allows me to point to a bunch of things on the page. So I'm going to give an ID on this paragraph of answer one. And while I'm here, I might as well give an ID on the other ones to, uh, you know, answer two, answer three, and so on. So, the first thing I have to do is I have to point to the thing on the page that has an ID of answer one. All right? In the DOM syntax, the way we do that is we say document. Document means somewhere on this web page. Get element by ID. And then in parentheses, I put the value of the ID, which is answer one. That says, find the thing on the page, find the thing on this web page that has an ID of answer one. Now, OK? So now that allows us to point to this. Now, what do we want to do to that, though? We could want to do a bunch of things. We could make change the color of it. We could change the uh, size of the font. We could do all sorts of things. But really what we want to do is we want to make it visible. So I'm going to change the visibility of it to visible. So let me try to get all this on the screen at the same time. I have it an attribute of this button on click. That means when the button gets clicked on. What do I want to do on the page? And I forgot something here. Let me put that in here now. I want to find on the page the thing that has an ID of answer one. I want to change its style. What about the style do I want to change? I want to change the visibility. And what do I want to set the visibility to? I want to set the visibility to visible. So we're like zeroing in. Because we could, we could do anything we want to on this page. We start looking at the page. That's what document means. We're narrowing it down to the thing on the page that has an ID of answer one. We're narrowing it down further that we want to change the style of that thing. And then finally, it's the visibility that we want to change this part of the style. color equal, right. So this points to the thing on the page that we want to change. This is the value we want to change it to. All right. Now there's a couple things I want to go over with, but I first want to show you that it works, and then we'll go over some of the 
finer points here. So I go and save that and refresh and click on that, it makes it appear. Click on that again. Well, it's already there, so it will still stay there. All right. What do you suppose it would look like, a button, to make it disappear? What, I would, what would I have to change about this? I'm going to change the text to say hide button. What about it would I change to make it disappear? Yeah, you change it to visibility equals hidden. And if we did that, then we have our two buttons. We can show the answer, and we can hide it again. Okay, so a couple things with the finer points of this. Notice that there's double quotes that go around the whole JavaScript expression. That document get element by ID, blah, 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 is a JavaScript expression that uses the DOM to set the visibility property of that particular item to visible. Notice inside the double quotes, I have the need for quotes, for the value of the ID and for the value I want to set it to. Those are enclosed in single quotes. All right? The reason is, is if I put these in double quotes, then JavaScript's going to think the, the statement ends here. All right? Whereas the statement really doesn't end until here. So if you're using double quotes on the outside, use single quotes on the inside. The other thing about this is the, the this is case sensitive. What that means is that it needs to be the proper, every letter in here needs to be, it matters whether it's upper or lower case. So the word document starts with D, right? So the first letter of the first word is lowercase. So document is lowercase. Get element by ID is a function. All right? And because it's a function, it has an argument after it. A function simply says, OK, go and do something. And here's some more information about what you want to do. But notice the phrase get element by ID is multiple words. So the first letter of the first word is lowercase. The first letter of each subsequent word is uppercase. So get element by ID. It matters if it's not done this way. As far as the value of the ID, generally speaking, if you have the value of something, you're going to put that in quotes, and that has to match whatever I called the ID down here. So I call it answer 1 with lowercase. It's going to expect it to be answer 1 with lowercase. If I put in answer 1 with an uppercase A, that's a different ID. All right? Style visibility equals visible. Now, all these things except for this, that's the only thing I made up, right? That's my ID. Everything else is part of the DOM and the JavaScript language, all right? So I can't say visibility equals go away or visibility equals don't show or something like that. When you're dealing with visibilities, your choices are visible and hidden. All right? Visible will show it. Hidden will not show it. Now, let me show you what will happen if I don't get this right. A very common mistake I make sometimes is I forget and I'll say get an element by ID, and I'll make it capital D. All right? If you do that, 
JavaScript just won't work. All right? And it'll tell you, if you look in the right place, that it didn't work and why it didn't work. If I'm using the Google Chrome browser, I can go up under Options, More Tools, Developers Tools, and I will see a console. And it tells me, in a roundabout way, what went wrong. Now sometimes, like in a case like this, the error message is fairly descriptive. Other times, it will tell you something that is confusing. So it takes a little bit of time to sort of interpret this. All right. In this case, it tells me line 12, document get element by ID is not a function. Well, that's a tip off that something about that is not right, right? Now, you might say, well, I remember there's, I definitely remember there's a function get element by ID. But if you don't have the proper spelling of it, or if you don't have the proper cases for the letters, it doesn't recognize it. So, in this case, since it doesn't recognize that, maybe you'd go and look up that function and say, oh, that's supposed to be a lowercase d. Then if you correct it, it'll be right. Notice no error. Other thing that could go wrong is if you don't, don't get the ID right. If I said answer one instead of answer digit of one. If I click on it, it will tell me cannot read property style of null. And that might be a little harder to understand, but what that is telling you is this doesn't exist. Therefore, I can't talk about the style of something that doesn't exist. So this is nothing or null, which probably means that the ID I've given it is not the proper ID because it couldn't find anything on the page that has an ID of answer O-N-E. If I get confused about the quotes and put double quotes here, It gives me a really cryptic error. Unexpected token. Uh, at the very least, it gives you a line. All right? And if you look at it closely, you can see a uh, nice thing about if you use Notepad++ is you can sort of see the color coding and if you match up, oh, this doesn't allow you to match up that. Uh, but again, that, that, isn't, that, that error isn't very clear, but it at least tells you what line it's on or what line it's around. Because it actually gave me an error on line 13 when the problem was actually on line 11. So if it gives you an error, look at that line and look at a few lines before it. Now. Notice something with display, uh, with the visibility of hidden, and that is, when I say display is visible or hidden, the answer still takes up the space that it would if it's there. So when I load the page, notice there's a gap there. That's because that answer, even though it's not visible, is taking up that space. So when I show it, that doesn't adjust the page at all. Um, if I did this in a different way, if I instead said display none, I could then set the display to block, or the display of 
This will more or less accomplish the same thing, but it's not going to leave the extra space. So when I click show answer, it drops the rest of the stuff down. So which way you want to do it really depends on just your preference for the particular page. All right. In this case, I think it looks better if I say visibility hidden and and if I if I do the visibility one. Let me do undo a couple times. And, of course, I can do other things to set off the question and answer. I can make the answer um, have a margin left of five pixels to indent it a little bit and maybe make the um, color red, and maybe bold. Again, notice how these three things work together. The content, so all the questions and answers, are in HTML. The way I want it to look is defined in CSS. And my CSS will define how I want it to look initially. In other words, when this page loads, I want all of the answers to be hidden. And then finally, my CSS can change anything about the page, whether it be about CSS or HTML. So now if I do this, now I can go in and I can make buttons for the other things. So let's go in and do buttons for the second answer. You could. In fact, let's go, let's do that one when I'm done with this. All right. How would I make this button show uh, this, I put this in the wrong place. So, how do I make these buttons work for the second question? What would I need to change? Answer one. I'll need to change it to answer two. All right, and then same thing with this one, answer three. So, show answer, hide answer, show answer, hide answer, show answer, hide answer. All right. Now, question was, is we have to put a, a, uh, um, a uh, we want to put a button that's going to show everything. All right. So, how do we do that? Well, I can go here and I could put a button down here. Actually, no, I can't do that because I can't type today. So, no, it, this is impossible. Okay, so I'm going to on click. And I want to do more than one JavaScript statement on the on click, right? So how do I do that? I can do multiple JavaScript statements 
and just separate them by semicolons. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste this three times. All right. So answer one, I change it to Answer one, answer two, answer three. Actually, it's setting them to visible, all visible, so I'll make this a hide all button. Then I'll do a show all button. I believe I did this right, so let's look at this. Show all, boom, we'll show it, hide all, boom, we'll hide it. All right, now, this code gets a little hard to read, all right? Now, if you try to put these on different lines, I think it's going to give you an error. Maybe not, we'll see. So I could put those on different lines and make it easier to read. There is, but what do we know about? Are we going to get an are we going to get one element if we get element by class? No, we're going to get a bunch of elements. All right. Which means which is okay. Right, but then we're going to have to write different JavaScript because we we could uh, if we get element by a class, we could get multiple elements. In which case, we're going to have to loop through to process all of them. So you could do get element by class. I believe there is. If not, there's a similar function. get almost by class name. Yes. But it will return multiple elements, not just one. This is why it's important, and if you remember way back, I said IDs have to be unique. IDs have to be unique because if we're writing JavaScript in this manner, when we point to something, we have to point to that one thing. We, there can't be any ambiguity of what we're pointing to. All right. So therefore, if we're using the ID to point to something, we have to do that. Um, next Monday, we'll continue with this and do some different things. But we'll sort of follow the same model. Uh, you could write an awful lot of JavaScript, including the menus that we saw on ESPN, by just using this sort of procedure, right? Have a user action on click on mouse over, right? You don't click on the menus on ESPN to go to, to see them. You just put your mouse over it. It's a different event. What is it doing? Well, it's making those things visible. So we're setting the visibility or we're setting the display property of those menus. And then when we mouse out, we set them back to invisible again. So just using this sort of template, we can do a lot of damage on our pages. Uh, either for something that's really practical or just dumb stuff if we want to. Um, I remember first playing around with JavaScript, I made a button that you couldn't click because every time you put your mouse over it, it changed the position of the button. All right, which again, not particularly useful, but just a fun way to show off your programming skills, I guess. All right, uh, we'll see you up in lab. I will, yeah, go ahead. So if you make, can a button have more than one on click? No. 
A button only has one on click. Now that one on click can call several statements. And the one thing that we'll see next week probably is the one on click can have, can call a function. All right? A function is a group of statements that we give a name to. And we do that simply because if this JavaScript got more confusing, it would make this page really hard to read. So you group all your functions and give them a name, uh, all your statements into, into something called a function, and then you give the function name. And that just makes the, the thing clean, cleaner. But that being said, a button could only have one on click event. Can, can be done either way. Uh, generally speaking, like um, as a developer, you might have a few JavaScript functions that you want to do on every one of your pages. And if you do that, it probably will be, benefit you to put it in a separate file, all right? Just like you do with CSS. On the other hand, there might be some piece of JavaScript functionality that really are only going to be on this page, in which case it really doesn't matter how you do it. All right, other questions? Uh, I'll see you in lab, those of you that go. Everyone else, have a good Thanksgiving, and we'll see you Monday for the last week of the course, amazingly enough.